Welcome to episode three, the interview on the lecture of civic ecology. Professor Lopez has already given two episodes on the topic of civic ecology. And in the interview, I will speak with him about some open questions and hope to represent the attendance and pose the questions that you as participants of this course might have. So, Professor Lopez, thank you for giving me the chance to ask you some questions on civic ecology. Uh, my first question is, uh, refers to the terms you chose, the terms you use. Uh, the first one is about the topic, why is it civic ecology? When I uh, heard the, the, the first two episodes, I thought, well, it could also be social, uh, social ecology or so societal ecology. Why is it civic ecology? That's a good question. Uh, I, I have to admit that I have been struggling to find the proper term that would cover all the subjects and ideas discussed in this class. However, as I explained in the first lecture, that civic ecology is premised upon the assumption that the well-being and sustainability of communities depend on civic engagement and civic action. So because of that, I use the adjective civic. And the other reason why is because I said that this relationship between humans, citizens, and the environment where they live at a certain time and place constitutes an ecological system. Mm -hmm. So here by ecological, I'm including the humans within uh, the context. Therefore, I thought, you know, civic ecology would be uh, a good term, although I have to agree that's not the perfect term. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not about repercussions or re reacting to repercussions, but it's about that I, as a citizen, have to change behavior or behave in a, in a certain way. Yes. As a member of a community. Yes. So I would say that contrary to other fields of knowledge in which the first person developing that knowledge, like a philosopher, is the primary goal of the knowledge acquisition. So here the goal, the objective is the people. So what civic ecology is in itself is a way of life of a community interacting with the environment in which they live. Mm -hmm. So all this conceptualization is an effort to present this as an acceptable theoretical, practical framework, by, except by whom, I would say by our peers. So as you know, the Western world is a, a culture heavily based on science and knowledge. So therefore, as, you, gonna, as we saw, the principles of civic ecology are quite practical principles. However, I spend some time trying to give some theoretical uh, uh, justification. And here there are two points that should be taken to, into consideration. The principles themselves, in these very, very simple forms, for me, they are relevant and necessary for a chance to take place at the community level. But there is another aspect of it. I am a researcher and involved with peers, work in the field of sustainability. Therefore, if I come to them, to this community of researchers and scientists, with a proposal for a paradigm shift, they will require certainly that I present some theoretic foundation for those principles. But ideally, civic ecology in its more uh, advanced form is a way of life, is a way of thinking about the world and our place, citizens, in that world. And then in, in this world, there are certain communities, aren't there? Yes. So the communities um, or community-based systems, could you clarify what a community is, uh, char what characterizes a community, and maybe give some examples so I can imagine what you mean? <laughs> yes, yes, certainly. Uh, you know, of course, that, you know, the the, the lecture in itself, the content, content of the lecture, has a certain vision. It envisions some type of society, uh, and that society envisioned by the civic ecology lecture in principle is not necessarily a real community. That's why I say that that ideal community in which civic ecology would unfold essentially as a way of life is a type of community that would emerge out of a paradigm shift. So if we, I see some difficulties in, in, in applying the approach itself under the current paradigm. 
So that is why I make a tremendous effort to justify the need for a paradigm shift. Because I believe if that paradigm shift takes place, all this concept that I'm talking about here would naturally emerge. There would be no need for conceptualizing. It would necessarily emerge out of life. So right now within the dominant paradigm, a community for me is a town with people mm -hmm. living in a specific environment at a local place. So of course we know that on the current paradigm, most of the people are not really connected to the place. They are so busy living their lives. And the institutions, the hierarchy of power is such that there are very little incentive for the community to get more in, in, engaged and assume responsibilities for their own way of life. So again, here, Civic Ecology has envisioned how as this uh, utopic, utopic under the current paradigm, but realistic if the paradigm takes place, the shift takes place, in which Civic Ecology again would be a way of life. Did I answer your yeah. question? <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, when we, when we uh, stick to the example of the town as a community, you spoke about civic duties. What would, uh, for us, the citizens of this town, be the duties? Yes, very, very good question. So again, I, I hear, uh, I know that uh, wherever I go and talk about civic ecology, I'll be always confronted with this vision of civic ecology and the reality out there. To be the duties, uh, what I mean from the vision of, of uh, civic ecology, emerges out of this understanding that we don't live alone, that we are interconnected, that our lives are in such a way related, not just to the, the closer friends, uh, members of our families, but to the members of other families and the environment itself. So the duties, first of all, call for responsibilities. Uh, a, out of a realization that my home is not the house where I live with my relatives, but it's also the other house of my neighborhood and the city, and beyond that city, up to the natural area that surrounds my city. Because that's what I'm talking about, uh, civic engagement and in, in duty, is come out of the citizens a, a, a realization of the need to allocate part of their times of their lives to the well-being of that whole. Not just, you know, spend 100% of their time concerned about themselves, uh, working very hard and concerned directly with the family, but uh, civic ecology is, called, is calling for this expansion of concerns that I embrace myself, the neighbors, the town, and the region where I live as part of my extended family. So, in the end, take some time and spend it on activities, on activities mm -hmm. for, for social, with social or ecological background or right. projects or something. As I explained, you know, uh, this uh, adaptive collaborative approach. So one of the requirements for the approach to work is that the members of the community come to the meetings. So the process of decision making is based on the sequence of meetings and participation. So the citizens have to realize that they live uh, busy lives, but they are committed to this process. So uh, if they are not committed because they are thinking they are too busy, I have no time for this, obviously the approach is not going to work. Mm. So you, you yourself started to talk uh, again about this adaptive management approach. So what I ask myself is, the problem with bottom-up approaches is always um, if they if they start, um, then they start at certain starting points, and then I imagine that at some level you have many approaches which have to be merged. How could that how could that happen? How could they be merged, and who would be responsible for that? Usually, in the practice of civic ecology, the expert or experts play a role of facilitator. So the, the role there is to bring all the different approaches and with the dialogue with the community to find out what type of approach or approaches are more convenient to address that problem. So, and this is so because civic ecology is a highly context-based science or perspective. 
And uh, as again, one of the principle of uh, civic ecology is methodological pluralism. So by that, I imply that it is not an effort or goal of civic ecology to promote or present a specific approach by a platform within which an approach can be developed. And that approach is infinite, depend on circumstances, depend on where you are working, depend on economic, political circumstances. But it's not the goal of civic ecology, again, to present one a specific approach, but uh, present a framework mm -hmm. within which a approach which is appropriate to the specific uh, context where the problem is developing, be uh, developed. So you just uh, spoke about facilitators. Yes. Um, are these facilitators just people who um, who try to explain how to tackle a problem, or are they also decision makers? And if they are no decision makers, would that uh, whole um, whole concept not um, result in a self-governance approach? Well, you know, the, the, the facilitators, uh, they are experts. They are people who have knowledge and experience, and this is not from one specific field. So I would say because of the transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach of civic ecology, in a process like this, there will be experts from different fields. There will be social workers, there will be sociologists, there will be ecologists, there will be business. So depending, again, if it is a business problem. So, But they also are decision-making in the sense that if I attend a group meeting as a facilitator, of course, I don't want to guide the decision my direction, but by my intervention. Mm -hmm. the things I say during that meeting, in some way I'm affecting the decision. But the decision making is a collective involving not just the facilitators, the experts, but also the ones that make policy, the policy makers, and the community at large. Okay, and where do these facilitators come from? Who, who, how do I become a facilitator? Right. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. But uh, we start seeing more and more approaches and programs in universities that are training this type of people. I myself, this is a very interesting thing, I, I propose the development of this framework, but I don't consider myself to be a good facilitator because, uh, you know, for, for, for reasons that, uh, uh, that are beyond uh, my capability, so there are people who are natural facilitators, people who have strong leadership and tremendous ability to communicate with other people. So those individuals are potential facilitators. So they can go and take uh, interdisciplinary training, depend on what type of what aspect of sustainability they want to work with and become really effective facil uh, facilitators. So I believe in most of these approaches, collaborative approaches to or community-based approach to sustainability, one of the problems, exactly, one of the difficulties for the success of these problems are the absence of good facilitators. So as this new paradigm, collaborative approach, community-based approach to sustainability, it spreads, become more uh, uh, accepted, acceptable, accepted, then I believe those facilitators will start showing up more often. Okay. So the, the, you just said that this, uh, the, the, this way of, of uh, addressing people leads to more sustainability. That's another term I would, I would like to ask you. What, what do you understand? There are so many different concepts of sustainability. What is sustainability for you? Yes, that's a very, very good question. And I believe that is one of the problems with attaining sustainability or become sustainable because there are so many definitions and people will work towards sustainability according to their views and perspective on sustainability. For me, uh, my definition, which I think is very simple, is to make sure, sure that the resources that I use in my lifetime will be available for others in the future. In other words, that I don't mind them, that I, in, in, in interest and in self-interest pursuit of success or, or richness or well-being, I completely exhaust the resources that provide services that are relevant to me. 
So I want, if I want to live sustainably, I have as a person, as an individual, responsible for the well-being of my community and the environment, that the resources that provide the services to me at my lifetime will be available for others in future generations, independently if the services that are important to me will be important or not to them. Okay, and the resources are not specific resources like just material, raw material, but mm -hmm. more than that, is that true? More than that, but material, of course, and uh, there is in ecology one emerging term that is very important to, to the definition of sustainability, which is the notion of ecosystem services, which are services that we take for granted, that we think are free, that are provided by ecosystem functioning, like pollination is a, is a service that is in which humanity heavily depends and if, for example, the, the bees disappear, I don't think that uh, the moment we have the technology to provide the pollination that are necessary mm -hmm. for some crops and the production of food. So clear air, okay, clean water, all this, even in spirituality, uh, uh, the environment, a forest, can be so peaceful and conducive to well-being and spiritual well-being. And so all these are uh, services uh, that the system, the natural systems provide to humans, not just to humans, because all the species, non-human species, also depend for that survival. And by the way, I want here to expand my notion of sustainability, because I think sustainability in general is a very anthropocentric concept. When people think about sustainability, is essentially maintaining those resources or services that provide, bene uh, provide services that people value. But I want to remind you that the services are also important and necessary for other life forms, not just human. And this is where come the ethical or responsibility component of sustainability that I have in thinking about sustainability to be concerned not, not, not just about the well-being of myself, of humanity, but well-being of the, no other human entities. Oh. That was really, that was really a, an interesting introduction to the, to the topic, but I would like to, to get to the, to the five principles you introduced. Right. Um, I think, well, first of all, my first question is, of course, as a researcher, I want to know how did you come to these principles? How did you choose them? And then in the, in the next step, I would be interested in, uh, in the fact that, or what you think about that, they sound so simple. And they seem, it, is, it seems to be so complicated to get them into people's heads. Very, very good question. Uh, I think they are simple and uh, I, want, I almost don't need the explanation. But let's say why, how I spent time in my life trying to put together the system. So again, uh, you should not forget that we live in a culture, in a society that is heavily biased towards science and towards the rationality of knowledge that we present. So I just didn't want to come and present, which seems so you know, uh, logical, principles, without a conceptual uh, theoretic foundation. So to build this system, I start actually from the end. I didn't start from the beginning. First of all, it was very clear to me that we cannot do it alone. That is principle number mm -hmm. four, five. So we have to work together to attain our goals. But then, uh, okay, so what is the theoretic justification? I mean, the, in, in commonly, it makes sense. We have to work together because needs that. But is there any theoretical argument or principles that justify, you know, the need for working together? So from that, you know, the next thing that I came out with was the ethical relationship. And from that, the, the possibility that uh, people, if we want to, get, to work together, we will be confronted with the possibility of people have different perspectives about the same thing. So that came of the different interpretation. And then, but why? I asked myself, why people have different perspectives about different things? And then came to the next one, which said, because we construct a reality. So our reality, my reality is not like as your reality, mm -hmm. because we have different understanding of what it means to be real. So then we have, you know, different interpretations. But in what type of world we would be allowed to have multiple realities and different interpretation? Then I had a problem because uh, the mainstream traditional paradigm, the mechanistic objective paradigm of science does not allow that. As a scientist, you know 
that uh, the science, our Western science, is essentially guided by the objective method, which is a method based on the belief that things we can reach the truth or can know as much as possible from anything if we apply an objective method. So if I stay with that approach, that paradigm, I could justify my uh, uh, multiple realities and different interpretation, and then the relational ethics, and then my working together. So everything would collapse. So through a struggle, I came out uh, to this relational perspective is in which actually meaning is generated out of relationships. So this is a little bit inversion because under the, the dominant paradigm, we believe we exist to relate. I am a person. And the relationship comes out of the fact that I'm a person. From my perspective of a relational paradigm is the relationship that I have with my, with other humans in the world in which I live that actually creates me. So that paradigm to me provide the strong, provide a strong philosophical basis for justify all the following steps. And the second question about why it seems complicated, it's not complicated, it's logical and can be easily understood. And as a matter of fact, when I find myself, I told you I'm not a good facilitator, but I have uh, found myself in situations that I had to provide uh, limited facilitation and I brought the principles, but I never had the need, talking to stakeholders, people, the, the members of the community, I had, I never had the need to justify theoretically each one. That justification is more to confront my peers in the research environment. Mm. That's uh, a thing I would, I would like to um, ask another question on, because you say you're on a, you work on a philosophical basis, and we know that, that uh, re re uh, relational, perspective from different dis from different disciplines we know this from biology we know it from soci sociology uh, sociology yes. and we know it from from business studies and different um, uh, disciplines but you say you're on a philosophical basis so how do you um, or do you want to um, adopt this to other disciplines or do you want to stay on that philosophical level and let the others see what they want to do with that approach? Yes, a very, very good question. Well, I honestly, I don't intend uh, that uh, others, other disciplines adopt this approach because depending on the context in which they work, maybe this approach may not be uh, the most recommended one. But for me, it's very important because I, I work within the context of sustainability and I explain to you what sustainability means at me and uh, to me, uh, because of this definition, this perspective I, I have about sustainability, the only possible way that we will be someday sustainable, according to my definition, is that if we work together and uh, you know, relate embedded in the environment where we interact and depend upon. And for this type of action and relationship in the world, to me, the current mainstream paradigm is not appropriate. So we have to move to the relational paradigm. So again, relational paradigm is critical and necessary from my perspective to the time of, type of work that I do. Okay, so let's, um, I would like to, because in, during the next lectures, I think we will, we will talk about more about the theoretical background. So I would like to once again, get back to the practical level. Um, you gave the, the example of a, a town, a city I live in, mm -hmm. and where I have my civic duties. What do you think is the biggest community that is able to, to, uh, to work on this, on this, uh, with this concept of civic ecology? Because I think when you say it, it can not be, um, not be handed down by, for example, governments right. or politics, then the question arises, what is the, the limit? That's a very, very good question because again, I'm, I'm aware of the difficulties of uh, implementation of this approach. And again, I'm always confronted with the practical possibility which is out there, the realistic and the utopian one. But I can always target the utopian one because to me, that's my vision of a sustainable world. So when I think of a sustainable world, first of all, it's not highly populated world. I don't think that mega cities are sustainable. 
So the, 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 the difficulties and problems with this mega series of that emerge in our contemporary paradigm would be tremendous, tremendous in the years to come. Because first of all, it's not ecologically speaking, a self-sufficient system. They need energy to operate, but usually they take that energy from a distance. The energy is not locally developed. Another serious problem about this mega city is the amount of waste that generate. If it was a sustainable system, it, they would should be able to process the waste and not throw the waste out of the local region where they live. We don't do that. So we generate so much waste because our waste is moved to a place that we have no idea. Mm -hmm. And usually that pay, there is some social justice issues here because that thing is usually dumped in places where people are not so empowered. So again, I don't believe that uh, this approach, community-based approach, could work in high, high, big cities, large population. So there is a tendency for this approach to, to work better in the small communities. So right now, if I think where this approach can work, I would say, you know, I can think of the the Nordic countries, because you know they have less population, they are more concerned about their environments and have a good way of life, so this is important. Also, I could think in places like Australia, I could think in places like uh, uh, New Zealand, but I see some difficulties in applying these places in highly developed European countries, or even uh, in the place where I come from in the United States, with this mega cities, the state I, I live, Four of the 10 largest cities in the United States are located there in Texas. So therefore, when I think about the utopic, and this is because I believe as we progress towards some type of threshold, uh, then eventually something is gonna happen. And depending on what comes out of that event, we will become a more sustainable world, or we really can uh, reach a point that uh, human humanity can be in danger to live. So what I hope here is that uh, we can reach that point without too much suffering in the world, that we don't need an epidemic to kill two thirds of human population for us to start this small community. So I hope uh, some process of, uh, process of mechanism will develop and we can turn towards sustainability and uh, well, avoiding that catastrophic event. But again, that's not possible with the level of population that we have currently. Hmm. So we hope that Smaller communities will will try to act on that uh, on that with that concept in mind and do uh, try to 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 become more sustainable in their let's say small community and then hope that this might spread and go farther. So um, well, I, very uh, <laughs> very good. I to be honest with you, I I don't think that what I'm doing will bring in some global change. But I, whatever I do in my life, I always think of Gandhi. And Gandhi said, be the change that you're gonna, you want to see in the world. So I essentially work on the change that I would like to see in the world. I don't claim that this is the only way to go, but for me, it's more an honest way to participate in the conversation, a movement that can bring us the sustainability that we, so, that we need so much. So at the current time and stage of my life where I find myself, this is the best I can do to contribute to this process. I'm not claiming here that civic ecology is what we need to have a global uh, sustainable society, but to me it's certainly an important one. But so we, we can hope that the students watching <laughs> our lecture will, um, will try to think about uh, situations in which they could themselves help establish a, a civic ecology. And so um, I would like to end this interview. I thank uh, the students for listening. I thank you uh, very much for this interview. And I'm really curious about the ideas in the lectures we will see. Thank you very much. Thank you.